Amen? Praise God. Anyway, been talking about this word. This word, as I pointed out, I wanted to point out four things. I said, first thing you have to do is you have to accept it as the word of God. I mean, if you have doubts about its validity, if you have doubts about its authority, if you have doubts uh, about maybe errors being in that word, then you're not going to be able to receive the word as it is meant to be received. I have relatives that I love very much, and I was talking on Facebook the other day with one of them in reference to a, he's an agnostic, he claims he's an agnostic. I know he's just a believer that hadn't surrendered to the Lord yet, but at any rate, uh, we were going in a conversation, a very civil conversation going back and forth, and he declared right quickly, I've read the Bible. And I said, I know you've read the Bible, and I understand that. But I said, you don't understand the Bible. You see, you can, there are theologians in most of these liberal universities that know this Bible probably better than I do as far as quoting scripture and verse and what it says. But they're not saved. They've never accepted it as the true word of God. Amen. They've never accepted this word as being from God. They've never taken John 1 and 1 and believed it. And so you can know every scripture in this word. But if you've not come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you're studying this word from a perspective without the Holy Spirit. That's why someone who's only been saved a short period of time can kind of hold their own against someone who hasn't been saved, and they begin to argue about this word. John chapter 1 is our verse of Scripture. If you want to turn there, I'll get to it in a moment. And so we talked about the fact that the believer has to accept this word, or a person who's soon to become a believer has to come to a point where he accepts this word as the word of God. The second thing that he has to do is what I brought out to my, to my relative. You have to understand it. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be a, a, a theologian that you have to be able to quote every verse in Scripture. And if you can do that, that's wonderful, but that's not necessary to understand it. Because once you begin to, once you get saved, once you accept it as the Word of God, it begins to minister to you. It begins to get down deep in you. You know, we talked about that last week. It gets down, down into to the marrow of your spiritual bone, and it begins to minister this word to you. You can read, sometimes you might read three chapters, five chapters, ten chapters, and you go back, what in the world? I just read. And you might not in your mind be able to even remember most of what you read, but you're a spirit man. Because you have the Holy Ghost in you, your, your Holy Spirit power that is within you has absorbed that word for you. And that's why you can uh, be talking to somebody one day and all of a sudden a verse of Scripture come to your mind. You couldn't have quoted that scripture 10 minutes before that. But the Holy Ghost bring it to your mind. So you come to that point where you begin to understand it. So the third thing you do, once you begin to understand what it says, and that's a, that's a by the way, that's a lifetime effort. I know people who have studied the Word of God all their lives, and, and they're, they're very versed in the Word. But it's never exhausted. You never can exhaust this Word. You can't say, well, I know it all. No, you don't. You didn't scratch the surface. You have not scratched the surface. There's nothing else written like this word. There's nothing else that you can set and read a verse of Scripture that maybe you've read 50 times, and maybe you've already gotten two or three nuggets out of it, and all of a sudden you read it again and go, oh my goodness, I never saw that. It's part of that Holy Ghost again. It's part of the Holy Spirit in you revealing and giving you revelation of what that word has to say. Because it, it, it's more than just a written word. It's just not, you got to understand, it's Holy Ghost inspired. People say, well, oh no, man wrote that book, so it's got errors in it. No, man, led by the Holy Spirit, wrote this book. And, and the, very, the very essence of what it is, the fact that it was written over hundreds and hundreds of years by, by 40-something different authors, and it comes to this point that these 66 books all agree. Some of these people were born 1,500 years after the other one. It's not like they had coffee together and decided what they were going to put in the book. 
That in itself, to me, I don't see how a man cannot serve God and know the power of this word. If you know the power of this word, it's going to minister to you. And when you begin to understand it, then you're well on your way to serving God. And I'm, I'm just going to say this. I'm not, I don't know if it's a fact. If it is, I challenge you. There are people in here this morning, you hadn't cracked the Bible and you can't remember when. You don't read it. You have this magnificent, excuse my misstep there, this magnificent work of literature sitting in your house growing dust. And you're struggling spiritually. You have sin in your life. And you won't pick up the book to read it. Because when you accept it as the word of God. And when you begin to understand its meanings. It's time to start. And I'll bring us to point three today. It's time to start applying it to your life. You see you can be again. You can be a born again believer. You know God's a God of mercy. And God's a God of grace. And we're justified by faith. Not by our acts. But that doesn't mean we're not to live by what this word says. My goodness, if you're a born-again believer, why would you not want to walk in obedience to this word? Why would you not? And, I, and I'm not talking about absolute perfection. There's not one of, of us in here that fits that category either. But I'm talking about taking what you begin to understand and allow it to influence you to the point that you begin to apply it in your life. Because I can tell you right now, God deals with me about things now that he didn't deal with me about 29 years ago. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it all. If he had just come in and go, okay, buddy, here's, here's the score. No, it's, it's progressive sanctification continues to change you as you apply this word. As you apply it to your life. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now, that's where we were at last week, talking about understanding the Word. That last part there. It says, and the darkness comprehended it not. If you comprehend it, if that light has been shined into your life, then what are you going to do with it? What are you supposed to do with it? God didn't give us this word. He didn't give us, I call it the manual for the product. We're the product, and this is the manual. If you buy uh, 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 something at a store that's mechanical, and it has a manual with it. Show you how to operate it. Show you how to function. That's all applying the word is, is following the manual. Again, we're not talking about complete perfection. There's no such thing here on this earth outside of Jesus Christ when he walked on the face of the earth. But it's time to start taking this word and comprehending what it says. And if you comprehend it, that means if you have not only an understanding of it, but it means something to you and it begins to reveal what this word is to be applied in your life. It helps you to know Jesus. When you begin to apply the word, when you begin to uh, 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 take it and, and, and make it part of who you are as a believer, it's going to do several things in your life. It's going to change the way you live, number one. When I got saved, changed my way of walking. Excuse the pun. Changed my way of talking. It changed my way of living. It changed my perspective on life itself. As I stated last week, it changes you. If you got saved and nothing changed, you got a problem. You need to go back and ask God, am I really saved? You know, I'm, not, I'm not telling you to doubt your salvation. But if nothing changed, you need to doubt that. It brings about change in you. 
It makes you want to live for God. So if you don't have the want, that means you're wanting the world. And I'm going to tell you right now, you can't have the world and God both. Not in the biblical sense. Now, we got to live in this world. We got to subsist in this world. We going to buy, sell, and trade, do whatever you have to do to live. But you got to make up your mind. And I'm here to tell you today, Crossway Church, listen to what I'm saying to you this morning. Time is short. And you better make up your mind whether you're going to live for God or not. Because if you don't, you're going to find yourself. You're going to come to this church one Sunday morning, and I hope everybody's gone. I hope there's not a dozen of you out there banging on the doors going, where's Brother Malden? Because I'm going to be in heaven. I believe in rapture. If you don't believe in rapture, that's on you. And I'm not planning on being here afterwards. I don't have to go through any cleansing, as some people say, in the tribulations. If the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't cleanse me, I can't be cleansed. That's the only thing that's going to cleanse you is the blood of Jesus Christ. And don't let somebody tell you, no, you've got to go through something to get, make it to heaven. It's not Jesus or, or Jesus but, or Jesus plus. It's Jesus. What he did on that cross and your faith in that, and that and that alone is going to get you to heaven. But when you do that, you get to that point where it's time to start applying the Word of God to your life. Quit messing around. Quit trying to hang on to the things of the world. Quit looking at the world going, oh, I still want to do this. I still want that. I want you to get the idea and the understanding that when you get saved, you need to start applying this Word to your life. Let this Word dictate to you how you talk. Let this Word dictate to you how you walk. Let this Word dictate to who you are in Christ Jesus. Because if it's not dictating those things to you, if it's not showing those things, if it is not putting a desire in your heart to do these things for the king, you're not doing it for reward. Yes, there, there's an understanding of reward in heaven, and I'm not, I don't want to get off into that. But it's not about doing it for reward. I have my new bride here. We're not quite as new as we was, but we're still new. We're still rookies. And since I broke this leg, and I don't, want, I don't want to embarrass her, but this woman has, has done everything that she can to take care of me. Yeah. And I, I'm, you know, I weigh 220 pounds, by the way. We lost 30 pounds. I weigh 220 pounds. It's not easy to take care of a 220-pound guy with a broke leg. But she's done that. She didn't do it because I looked at her and said, okay, Carmen, you better cook my dinner. You better do this. You better do that. You better be my chauffeur, my maid, my nurse. No, she did it. She does it because she loves me. She does it because she cares for me. Okay? Now, Jesus Christ died for me and her both. He died for you. He died a horrible, horrible death. But he did it because he loves you so much. He, he knew who you were before you were ever, before you ever had parents. And he died for you because he loved you. Not because he had to. He could have balked at the Garden of Gethsemane or anywhere in between. He could have balked on the cross and said, this, I ain't putting up with more of this. The Bible tells us very clearly he could have called a legion of angels. We know one angel put the whooping on almost 200,000 Philistines a long time ago. So a legion of angels is about 10,000. Uh, you know, it would have been a terrible thing if he had called on that legion of angels. But he didn't do it, ladies and gentlemen. He didn't do it because he loves you. So when you get saved, when you begin to understand what this word says, when this understanding begins to give you revelation about what is sin and give you revelation about what you need to get out of your life, you can't just turn a blind eye to it and say, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to deal with that. That's what I did for years before I got saved. I'd, I'd literally lay in the bed at night and God start convicting me about my soul and I would push it out of my mind because I didn't want to think about it. I didn't want to think about going to hell. I wanted to think, well, I'm a pretty good guy, you know, so God's going to go, hey, old Mike, he's a good one, let's keep him. It don't work that way. You have to be born again. And if you're born again, you're going to accept this word of God as the inerrant word of God, 
you're going to begin to understand it as you study it. If you're not studying it, then something's wrong. You should have a hunger and a desire to read the Word. And unfortunately, that wanes sometimes after we get saved. We're not quite as hungry for that Word as we was when we first got saved. You need to pray about that. Lord, give me back that. You know, I mean, you put food in front of me, you know, I can do pretty good. Well, this is spiritual food. And this spiritual food needs to be desired as much as a piece of uh, Brother Tony's, what do you call it, five-layer dessert? It does. We, we, can, we can desire the things, you know, that feed the flesh. We need to feed that spirit man. And it has to, to feed us in such a way that we've comprehended the essence of what it, you know, God just doesn't give us instructions for the sake of giving us instructions. How many of you men out there ever start trying to put something together and about 30, 45 minutes into it, you decide to read the directions, you know? <laughs> you know, you break down and go, well, maybe nobody's looking, you know. <laughs> Come on now. Yep. All you guys should be laughing on that one. So the first thing it's going to do, once you begin to comprehend this, once you begin to, once you begin to get it, that's the best way I know how to say it, Amen. then you begin to have a desire to want to apply it, okay? And when that comes, it makes you a, one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to be a fruit bearer. You're going to bear fruit. What does that mean, brother? I don't know, Matthew 13, 23 says, but he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some 100, some 60, some 30 fold. You begin to hear it? Oh, I need to do this. Oh, I understand that. But then you got to apply it. I know people who, and I had to pull up old testimony. I'll give you this before, but it goes back to when I was in the police department. And I was witnessing to this guy. And he looked at me, and i never forget the look on his face and, and the tone of his voice. He said, what do you mean saved? I'm saved. I've been saved since I was 12 years old. And my first thought was, or I, 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 if I remember correctly, I told him, I said, you know, I worked with you for 14 years. I've never heard you once speak the name of Jesus. I've never heard you once witness to me. How am I supposed to know you're saved? There was no application of the word. I mean, he cussed just like I did. Had some of the, you know, listening in on all the dirty jokes I listened in on. I drank with him before. I did all these things that I no longer do. Not my doing, but God's doing. He did all of those things. There was nothing, there's nothing to set him apart. Not that he had to impress me. That's not what I mean. What I mean is if you're a fruit bearer, people are going to see it. There's going to be evidence. What fruit is, is evidence of who you are. If you've got no fruit in your life, there's no evidence. If you got tried for being a Christian, they couldn't convict you. And so, we need to be the bearers of fruit. Luke 8, 21 says, He said unto them, My mother and my brethren are those which hear the word of God, and then those last two words, and do it. we got to be doers of the word. We can't just claim Christianity and say, well, oh, I'm a born-again believer. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Let's go have a beer. I'm a Christian. Let's go chase some women. I, you know, let's get real. You can't do that. you got to hear this word. And you've got to at least be living a life that is attempting to do what the Word of God says. And you can't pick and choose what you want to do and what you don't want to do. A lot of Christians like to do that. Well, I just don't believe there's anything wrong with drinking, Brother Malden. You know, Jesus drank wine. Show me in the Bible one verse of Scripture says Jesus drank wine. Well, he made the water into wine. Yes, he did. You look up the definition of the word wine, you'll see that it has more than one meaning. It has several meanings. 
And there's not one thing in this Bible that says that it was intoxicant. I've looked up every verse of Scripture on wine there is. And if you're a beer drinker, if you're a wine drinker, I'm sorry, you're, you're violating the Word of God. The Word of God tells us very clearly that we don't drink strong drink. And you can sit and try to make that right all day long. The only thing that says anything that indicates Jesus drank wine is it says he drank from the cup when he was doing communion. Well, guess what that word cup means? Grape juice. And there's a difference. A word wine can even be a cluster of grapes. So the word is used interchangeably, and sometimes it is intoxicating. But nothing in this word of God indicates that a believer should drink it. Ladies and gentlemen, I worked 25 years in law enforcement, and I've seen drink destroy more families. Almost probably run 50-50 with drugs. It is a drug. It may be a weaker drug. It may be a legal drug, but it's a drug. Anything that makes you want to jump off of a building because you think you can fly is a drug, okay? And I've had them do that. I've had them do that. If it deters your thinking, if it deters your ability to function, it's not of God. God did not give us that for that purpose. Now, that's enough said on that subject. I don't even know where that come from. But anyway, you, you read the Word of God. The second thing you have to do, you don't have fruit, but the second thing you're going to do is you're going to have to be obedient to it. And again, I, I say, I got a little ahead of myself there, you can't pick and choose what you want to do. You can't say, well, I like this one. Because... When you walk in obedience, the first thing it's going to do is going to change your lifestyle. See, when I got saved, my, li my whole lifestyle changed. And again, I'm not boasting on myself. This is not Mike Mullen got saved and he become this great guy, you know, because he could do all these things. No, no, no. This is the power of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is what makes you want to go in and pour out your alcohol supply down the sink. That, that, that's the Holy Ghost that did that. You know, the, in the old days, I would have been going, boy, that's an awful lot of money there, you know. And it was. But I wanted to do that. I, and I took pleasure in that. And I'm going to put it down the sink. We had a party there, you know. We joked that our sink, sink was drunk, you know. You got, why? Because we wanted to be obedient. I knew what the Word said. I knew. I was raised in church. I, I had a head knowledge. I just didn't have a heart knowledge. But once I got that heart knowledge, now I wanted to take what I already knew and I wanted to apply it to my life. And it changed my lifestyle, folks. Because it's the, it's the influence. It is the influence of the content of this book that reveals to me how to apply it to my life. You're reading, you're studying the Word, and you go, hmm, oh, wait a minute. And then a thought comes to your mind. Oh, you know, maybe you need to, maybe you need to do this. Maybe you need to stop that or whatever, the, whatever it ministers to you. That's how it works. This content will influence your lifestyle. And if you don't ever read it, that's like having someone that's a good influence on your life, but you don't ever hang out with them. You know, when your kids are being raised, you're always concerned about who they're hanging out with. You know, don't hang out with little Johnny. He's a bad influence. Hang out with little Jimmy. He's a good influence. Usually the parents have that backwards, but that's okay. But, but you, you want that child, if he's going to be around anybody, you want him to be a good influence. You know, it goes back to what I was talking about, married couples. You know, people get married thinking they're going to change their spouse. and they are going to change their spouse. If one of them's not living for God, the, the likelihood is they're going to be the one that gets influenced. Because they're going to get tired of waiting on that wife or that husband to come to the Lord, and they're going to start giving in a little bit at a time, and next thing you know, they're both living in sin. And so, it's, uh, it's the application by influence, or excuse me, it's the content and the influence thereof that makes you want to apply this to your life and begin to, to live. That's, that's, uh, uh, that's where that change takes place. And you begin to reevaluate everything in your life. And so, you're now walking in, that's what the Bible calls walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. Because if you walk in the flesh, you're going to gratify the flesh. You have to allow, you have this power in you, you have this power of the Holy Ghost. You, you get it when you're saved, when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. When you get baptism in the Holy Spirit, then you're, you're even more influenced 
by the power of the Holy Ghost. You have this understanding, a deeper understanding of the Holy Ghost. And you'll begin to not only walk in the Spirit, but you be, begin to walk with the spiritual guidance of the Holy Ghost in everything you say and do. That's why I encourage everybody to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. It, there's, there is a different, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not more of the Holy Ghost. I don't, I've never believed that. You can't split the Holy Ghost up and go, I'll give you half now and half later. That's not how it works. It's your understanding, it's your in, the influence that the Holy Spirit has on you and your yieldedness to that Holy Spirit that is already there. And it is biblical. Don't tell me it's not biblical. It's biblical. And it's biblical that it is evidenced by the speaking in other tongues. And that's where everybody gets all hooty hooty and gets scared. Oh, that's, that's of the devil. Well, if it's of the devil, why does it make you want to obey God? Why does it give you a stronger desire to live for God? No, you're not of the devil. That's a, that's a lie from the devil. And I've seen people who want to get saved. I've seen people that come forward to the altar and they get saved. They want to live for God, but they just can't. They just don't. Just something doesn't happen there that needs to happen. And they struggle. They go back and forth. They come, they come for salvation. I, you know, when I was a kid, I got saved every week. And you may think that's funny, but I did. Because I didn't have any understanding of justification by faith. And I didn't know how to apply it. And I didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I had the Holy Spirit in me because I, I genuinely gave my heart to the Lord. And I thought I'd backslid. When I'm Monday, the first thing I did wrong, I thought, well, I'm just backslid. I might as well go ahead and just go on, you know. And then Sunday, I'd be back in church. Not optional at my house. And I'd get convicted again. I would genuinely go down. I was in a cycle there. But it never really stuck because I never got baptized in the Holy Ghost. When I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden I have this increased desire to live for God. I have this increased zeal to, to hear what the Word of God has said. I have this increased sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. When I got on a ladder and broke my leg, Holy Spirit told me not to. He did. And my first thought was, this is a dumb idea. And then I had to prove it. I'm, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit tell you don't go down that road. That's right. Amen. That's right. Holy Spirit tell you don't say that. Yeah. He'll, you know, he'll even tell you don't eat that. <laughs> That's when it's hard, you know. You're going after that third piece of pie and ain't going, don't eat that third piece of pie. I'm serious. He takes care of the small things. I'm getting a little off subject there, but anyway, somebody needed to hear that. So, once you begin to walk in the Spirit, go to, go to Romans chapter 12. I love this verse. I've been all over it the last uh, month or so. And I just, every time I start studying, I go back to it. And there's just so much meat in these few verses here. Romans chapter 12. If you're there, say amen. Verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, excuse me, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Amen. Anybody ever seen uh, a butterfly? Everybody's seen a butterfly. That's a stupid question. A butterfly goes through four different stages. First of all, there's an egg. And that egg is on a leaf. But the leaf has to be a certain type of leaf because once the larva or the caterpillar comes out of that, he literally eats his home. He eats his host. And it has to be something that that particular larva will like to eat. And then he spins his cocoon and he goes into a, 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 a transformation. This word here. This word transform says, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind as another word for a metamorphosis. 
which is what happens with that butterfly in that cocoon. When he's in that cocoon, a change takes place. <laughs> and when he comes out of that cocoon, he's no longer a larva. He's no longer a, a caterpillar. He turns into a butterfly. When the butterfly first comes out, the wings are not spread and beautiful. They're back and close into the body because obviously that's how the cocoon has it wrapped. And it takes a period of time for that butterfly to get those wings out where it can spread its wings and fly. When you look at that, that's a good example of a person, a human being. The egg represents being born into this world. We're born into sin. We're, we're, we're locked in to the fact that we're born into sin. We're locked in just like that egg is going to become a larva that's going to eat its host. You know, the host leaf is like the world. It's like your soul. And the first thing that larva does, once it comes out of that egg, it begins to destroy itself. It be destroys the very foundation which we do when we live in sin and continue to live in sin. God has given us this wonderful foundation. He's given us this beautiful gift of salvation. Well, the cocoon stage represents salvation. We go in and this metamorphosis of salvation begins to take place in our life. And it's just as that larva changes in that cocoon, we change in this world. And we come out a little bit different. We're not perfect when we come out. There, there, there's a period of time that we have to go through where we can get those wings out and begin to fly. When Jesus comes back, ladies and gentlemen, our wings will be out and ready to fly. And that old gospel song, I fly away, will happen. It's not a myth. It's not a story tale. It's not something that somebody made up. Glory to God, I'm here to tell you, we're going to fly away. We're going to fly out of this place. We're out of the cocoon right now. We're out of that stage. We're in that stage when we're trying to spread our wings a little bit. And we need to do that. And we do that by applying this word to our life. Don't be a, don't be a hypocrite. I can't brag on much between the years that I was raised in a church and the years that I finally come to the Lord. The one thing I can say in all those years, I was not a hypocrite. I did not go to church and live the life I was living. I, I knew better than to go to church. I knew if I went to church, I'd get convicted. That's how much God had a hold of my heart and was already working on me. And so I thought, I'll be smart. I just won't go to church. And there was a church blackout in my life between the time I was 18 and I was 44. I did very little church. But when I finally, <laughs> glory to God, when I finally got saved, there was, I was in the cocoon. I went into that cocoon and I come out, I had wings. They ain't spread out yet, but they're getting there. They're coming to a point. And I believe it's coming soon. That's what takes place, that metamorphosis, that word transform there literally means metamorphosis. And verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. That word conformed means patterned. If you, you know, lifestyles have a pattern. He has a, you know, when we looked at criminals, we'd say he has a pattern of behavior. And that's how we would catch a lot of them. You know, outlaws, some of them are, are, are kind of smart, but most of them just ain't real bright. Because, you know, they th always think they can get away with something. And they may get away with 10 things, but we're going to catch them on one. And when we do, they're going to pay for that 10 plus maybe 10 more. I told one, I sat down and figured it out for one guy one time. He robbed a, a, a liquor store. And he got, I forget how much, 100 and something, $200, something like that. I said, let's sit down and figure out how much money you just made. I said, because you're going to be paying for this for the next 25 years. I said, you take that $200 and you divide it by 25 years. I said, man, you ain't even making minimum wage here. I said, you go out there and work at McDonald's and do better than this. You see, there's a pattern. And we begin to establish a new pattern when we get saved. That's that change that takes place. That means the old man is gone. Spiritually speaking, the old man is gone. But not only spiritually speaking, physically speaking, it needs to be gone. In other words, we need to quit some stuff we're doing. We need to get the sin out of our life. Now, the sin is covered by the blood. 
You say, well, I thought the sin was covered by it. It is. And we are justified by faith. But God's not a fool. God knows your heart. And the problem with sin is what does sin do? Sin separates you from God. If you're separated from God, you can be saved and, and be in sin. I know that's not popular preaching, but it, it's scriptural. And what happens is you're separated from God. And I believe that if you're separated from God long enough, you'll backslide. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't believe you can backslide. I believe once saved, always saved. Well, you can believe whatever you want to. You have to show me the scripture. Because I've looked at front and back, and I've never found it. It's not in there. But it is a, a, a change, a pattern that takes place when we get saved. And when we begin to set a new pattern, we're not conformed. We're no longer with that pattern of the world. We're with a pattern of God. And we begin to pattern ourselves after this word. That's why we apply it to our life. And so we're not conformed to the world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Go through that metamorphosis by the renewing of your mind. Remember, anytime you read the word mind, you can pretty well interchange it with spirit. Your, your mind, your, the spirit of your mind comprehends that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Doesn't say you'll be perfect. Doesn't say you won't ever make a mistake. Doesn't say you won't sin. First right. John chapter 1 tells us if you say you don't sin, then you're a liar. Right. I didn't call you a liar. The Word of God tells you you're a liar. Right. Yeah, you got sin in your life. I'm not telling you we live a life of sin. When you read things in the Greek, you'll find it says habitually sin. And it's talking about a pattern. Talking about the pattern of your life. And so... That brings us to that point of, of the third point of building our faith. You cannot have strong faith without applying this Word of God to your life. It builds faith in you to do what this Word says. It gives you an attitude of belief. gives you an attitude of trust. And it begins to set a pattern of a born-again child where faith enters in and becomes the reason that you apply this word to your life. Now, I didn't say that very well. I, 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 somebody distracted me by talking. But faith is the persuasion of the mind that a certain thing is truth. That's what faith is. You go from not believing to believing. You're, you're persuaded by the truth of what is said. All right. <laughs> I posted something the other day. I said, there's nothing like that awkward feeling that when you're in the middle of an argument, you realize you're wrong, you know. <laughs> Faith is the persuasion of truth. And that's what this word is. It's truth from beginning to end. And so it persuades you to believe what this word says. And if it's truth, it's a guidepost for your life. It, it, it lays out for you how to live your life. It lays out for you uh, how to be a Christian, how to, what to do and what not to do. And it's not, a, you know, living for God is just not about giving stuff up. You know, when I was in the world, one of the things that kept me in the world for so long was that I was afraid of what I was going to have to give up. And then when I gave it all up, I've never missed it. So that's nothing more than a devil lying to you about what truth really is, you know. So... Uh, if it's truth, then it means I need to live by that. I need to live by that truth. I mean, if that's the truth of life, is that not what everybody's after? What is the meaning of life? How many times have you heard that one? Meaning of life is to become a born-again believer and serve Jesus Christ. If you've got any other agenda than that, then you're on your way to hell. Ooh, that's hard, Brother Mullen. Truth is hard sometimes, but it's still truth. And there's a heaven, there's a hell, and there's no place in the middle for good old boys. There's no, no place in the middle for people who say, well, I'm a good person, God's not going to send me to hell. No, God's not sending you to hell, you're sending yourself. Because he's made a way. If you'd read this book, you'd know, you'd understand that there's a way to go to heaven. There's a way to reap the rewards of salvation and it's not just about heaven, ladies and gentlemen. I've enjoyed life 
Oh, glory to God. I've enjoyed life more in these last 29 years than I ever did in the 44 years prior to that. And I drank several truckloads of, uh, of alcohol in my day trying to have a good time. I've been there. I'm not bragging about it. It's just a fact. Party guy? Yeah, I could party. I could party with the best of them. Looking for happiness. Looking for fulfillment. I never found it. It's an endless pit. Right. Alcohol, drugs, and all the nonsense that the world has for you, all the entertainment that the world tries to entertain you with. I'm amazed at what some of you post on Facebook. All of that nonsense is not going to bring you fulfillment. The only thing that's going to fulfill your life is when you get to that place, where you go through the cocoon and you get that transformation that takes place there. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. I've got a couple of minutes. I'm going to get through this this morning. I've already taken a one-part message and put it into a series, so we're going to get through this. Now, I'm not going to read all this. I'm just going to read a little of it because it's, it's about... 15 verses, 20 verses long. Ephesians 4, 17. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of your mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Talking about how we were before we got saved. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to the lasciviousness to work all in cleanliness with greediness. But ye, Crossway Church, ye have not so learned Christ. If so, be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as truth is in Jesus. And then it goes on to lest for the next 15 verses or so, or 12 verses or so, it goes on to list all, so many of the things that we need to get out of our life that are no longer there. So a lot of times when you're applying, verse 20 there says, but ye have not so learned Christ. That word learn literally means to understand. You, you begin to understand this word, and then it goes on and it lists all these things that you need to get out of your life. It's not a complete list. But it gives you an idea of how God expects you to get certain things out of your life. And so, verse 23, let me, let me jump to verse 23 there. I'm about to forget my one I was going after. And be renewed in the spirit of your, your mind. You're renewed by what you already understand. You're renewed by that metamorphosis that takes place in there and that beginning of the understanding that you have. And it brings about a different thinking on things. In other words... Uh, you know, I, I, I may have drank alcohol before, but after I got saved, I, my thought process, I don't want alcohol anymore. That's not right for me anymore. I'd have argued that with you till the cows come home a couple of weeks before that. But I, that was my different thinking on that. And there was a lot of other things that I'm not going to get into because of none of your business that God told me I needed to quit doing too. Okay? And again, it's not just about what you have to give up. But it's about the, the change in the thinking and the desire that is now within you that makes you want to apply this new thinking to your life. You see, it's not my, it's not my format. It's not my pattern that I'm lifting out. I didn't get saved and go, oh, okay, I know everything about how to live my life now. No, this pattern is a continuous work. I'm still stretching those wings out. I'm, I'm getting there, but I, I'll never get completely free until the Lord comes back. When we do that, we're going to be that, we're already a new creation, but we're going to be that complete. The Bible talks about perfect. When he uses the word per perfect, it usually means complete. We're not quite complete yet. We're saved, we're on our way to heaven, not doubting your salvation, not doubting my salvation. But we're not complete, and we will be someday in our glorified bodies. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Mm. Praise God. So this renewing, this renewing takes place and it 
brings about that metamorphosis and you begin to just completely change your thinking. And it's not, it's not something that happens all at once. It's a process. And that's where you, where you begin to spiritually mature as you get older. The more you, longer you serve God, the more you attempt to apply his word to your life, the more you're going to be fulfilled in your relationship with God. I know some people suffer from depression for different reasons. Sometimes it's a chemical imbalance or whatever the case might be. Go to your word. When that begins to come on you, go to your word. Because it, it, can, it can take that pattern and you can be set free from that. You can be set free from that. The answer is in the word. The answer is in you drawing closer to God. It doesn't mean you're a, a faulty Christian. If you have depression, don't let anybody lie to you and say, well, you're doing something wrong with you. No, it just means that's part of the pattern that hasn't been changed yet. I have other patterns that haven't been changed yet. God's working on me, believe me. But, but as life goes on, you spiritually mature. You begin to change. You begin to, to see things that 20 years ago when you got saved, you didn't see. That's that metamorphosis is still not quite set free. The, the, the change took place. You're a new creation in Christ when you got saved. I'm not, I'm not talking about your, your soul. I'm talking about your spirit man and the growth of that spirit man. Because if you're where you were a year ago, spiritually speaking, then you need to get on your knees and ask the Lord to help you get back to where you need to be. And I've used this example many times before. If you're up in the mountains and a little spring-fed stream comes in and it goes into a little pool there and it has an outlet over there and that outlet goes out and there's always fresh water coming in and always, you ever notice in the mountains there's always water running? You know, you can drive those roads and there's a river and it never ends. You know, that's those ice, the ice caps on top of those mountains feeding that. But if that ice cap runs out, or if that pool gets clogged up at one end, that water will get stagnant after a while. It'll just lay there. It has nothing fresh coming in, and there's nothing that needs to be taken out being taken out. You see, that's how our spirit man is. We've got things in there that still need flushing. If you've ever, if you've ever had to try to flush out a, a, a clogged up line, you know what I'm talking about. There's just junk in there. There's gunk in there. There's things in there you can't see, smell, or, or know that there, but it's in there. God knows it's in there, and He loves you, and He's so patient with you and, and me, and, and, and He gives us time, but you've got to have something fresh coming in all the time. That's why I, I decree the big three all the time. The three things that a Christian, has, I feel, needs to do to stay a strong Christian is he needs to be in the Word, he needs to be in prayer, and he needs to be in the house of God. If you, if you neglect one of those three, then you have you, you got a clog there. And you no longer have that part of the fresh is coming in. There's a threefold spring coming in there. One's the word, one's the prayer, one's the, the house of God. And the house of God, don't, don't under, you know, we're not, a, the church is not perfect. You know, and the world just loves to point that out. You know, they love to see our mistakes. But don't discount the importance of being in the house of God. It is essential. I believe it is essential to your growth as a... Now, I'm not telling you that if you don't go to church, you won't go to heaven. That's not my job. God will make that judgment, not me. But I'm telling you, if you're a believer, again, why would you not have a desire to be in the house of God? Why would you not want to go to God? Why would you not want to pray? Why would you not want to read the Word? Those three things will keep your little pool, your little spirit man, it'll keep it fresh, and it'll keep growth going on in you. Amen? Praise God. Michael, y'all come on up. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Psalms 1 and 39, 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. I'm going to tell you, you need to jot that verse of Scripture down. One, Psalm 139, verse 23. Our servers are going to get ready to serve, folks. But, but let's, let's stay focused on the message here. 139, Psalms 139, 23. Listen to the words. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. You need to pray that prayer because that works against you not wanting to hear truth. And everybody in here, if I asked you if you wanted to hear truth, you'd say, yeah. 
but too often we've, truth, we've pushed truth back if it's uncomfortable. If it's something that may be, you know, I, I know I need to deal with that. I just, you know, I just want to deal with it right now. That verse of Scripture, you need to pray that because God will show you those things. He'll expose those things to you. And that's, that's, like, that's like vitamins in your spiritual food. That's like eating the best of spiritual food. When you hear from God, God don't, you know, preacher cuts you some slack sometimes. God don't cut you no slack. He's merciful. But when it comes to telling you what you need to hear, <laughs> he's fixing to lay it on the line to you. He ain't going to candy coat it. He ain't going to sugarcoat it. And he will definitely tell you the truth. Amen? Amen. Because when you do this, you, you come to that, you come to that place in your relationship with God. Because it, it comes to that place where it's not really based on the reasonableness of what God says, but it's based on the fact that God said it. I'm going to say that again. When you begin to be convinced of these truths, of this word, you know, it's not about the reasonableness of it. It's about the fact that God said it. You know, man wants to argue with the word. My, my relative loves to argue about the word. Oh, the word's contradicting itself. You know, no, it's not contradicting itself. God said it, that makes it so. Amen? Praise God. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. Lord, I just praise you. I praise you once again for this magnificent word. We come to you this morning, Lord God. Maybe there's somebody here that you're beginning to accept the Word of God. You're beginning to realize that God is dealing with your heart. Maybe you've walked this aisle before. Maybe you've come to the Lord before, but maybe you just need to come back maybe you need to come to this altar and spend some time at the altar the altar is open at this time if you need prayer for anything I'll be happy to pray for you but maybe you're here this morning and maybe you need a little more than the altar maybe you need to come and let me pray a prayer with you this morning God's calling you back online he's calling you back where you need to be He's telling you you've been on dangerous ground. He's telling your heart. He's revealing your thoughts to you. He's revealing your, re revealing your motives to you. And he's calling you back into the fold this morning. He's telling you, I love you, my child. I died on that cross for you. Don't turn your back on me now. I will never leave you nor forsake you. But you must turn unto me. You must come to me. Like a little child, you must come in faith and humility. And I will receive you and I will change you and I will mold you and shape you into the man and woman you need to be. I call out to you this day, my child. I call out to you. And I draw you. I died for you and I love you and I would have you with me for eternity if you would only turn to me. Thus saith the Lord. If that's you here this morning, don't hesitate. Don't put it off. Now I promised another day. Anybody here? You're not secure in your soul this morning. Anybody? Praise God. This altar is open at this time. If you'd come, please, and partake of the altar this morning. If you need prayer for anything this morning, I'd be glad to pray with you.